Hello and welcome to week two in the Churches Together in Ramsbottom Lent series for this year. If you're not quite sure who I am, my name is Ian and I currently have the joy of being the curate in charge of the Ramsbottom and Edenfield team. And this week I get that extra joy of spending this little bit of time together with you all wherever and however you are meeting as we continue on our theme of journeys. So over the course of the next few weeks as we head up to Good Friday and Easter Day we've been thinking a little bit about some of those markers on Jesus's journey as he heads towards the cross and kind of teasing out some themes that maybe we can apply to our own Christian journeys. Last week, as I hope you saw, David began with some thoughts around setting off and today, well today we're, we're kind of thinking about travelling. We have two excellent passages to look at and the first one is quite long. So we've given you today two whole chapters from the book of Numbers. So I'm going to keep my reflections on those ones fairly short actually, so you've got a lot of time in your groups to read them, to digest them, to pick over them. But I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction. See Numbers chapter 13 and 14. It comes at an interesting point really in the life of God's people. See by this point they have been freed from slavery in Egypt and they've been journeying with the Lord through the wilderness for a while and what we get in Numbers 13 and 14 is that moment where Joshua and Caleb and a handful of other people well they're sent by the Israelite community to kind of spy out the promised land. They kind of got to the border and they send a few people ahead to see what it's all about. Unfortunately though, even though those uh, men who are sent to spy out that country, they come back with a good report. It's not all plain sailing. God's people pause. They falter. They've been traveling so long in fact, that something has almost made them begin to question whether or not the destination is actually worth the journey there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you now to pause for a moment and have a look at that first question on the questions for this week. It's a kind of an opportunity to have a think about some of the things that have happened to God's people on the way to this moment. So give the video a pause, have a chat through that first question, and then come back in a couple of minutes after you've had a look. Welcome back. I hope in your groups you enjoyed that little chance to have a think back about some of the things that have been those kind of markers on the journey for God's people up until this point. They've of course had a few hundred years as slaves in Egypt, until when they cried out to the Lord, he appointed Moses to be the man to lead them to freedom. So they had the plagues, they had the Passover, when God's people were spared. And then they were led out to freedom through the parted Red Sea. As they've travelled, they've had the presence of God with them in the pillar of cloud and fire. They've been given the law, they've built the tabernacle, they have a place to regularly worship the God who travels with them. Then too, they've had that experience of being fed and provided for. The manna, the quail, the water from the rock. But like I said, when they hit this point, when they seem so close to everything that God has promised, they really do seem to begin to question whether the destination has actually been worth the journey. It's a funny effect that travelling can have on us sometimes, isn't it? When we travel for so long, how do we keep step with where we think we want to be going, where we think God might be leading us? For God's people, even though those people they send to spy out the land come back with such a good report, they have that moment of wondering, well, can God really, can he really cast out the people already in the land? Can he protect us? Can he lead us? Can he fulfil his promises. Even in those moments when the whole community seems to be surrounding Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, when they're rebelling, when they don't seem to want to go the full way with God, even in there, of course, there's grace. 
Moses tells us the Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love, forgiving sin and rebellion. So overall, God's purpose for his people will reach its fulfilment, even though there are these moments when the destination doesn't quite feel as though it's worth the journey. So what I'd like to do now is pause the video, have a read through those couple of chapters. I do suggest you break it up, have a few people read a few verses, and then have a look at the questions on the sheet. Welcome back again. I do hope you enjoyed that first half of today's session. As we continue to think about traveling, well, our second passage for today takes us to a fairly interesting moment in the Gospels, doesn't it? Only Luke records this particular moment. And when I thought this week about this particular passage, what actually came to mind? Well, it took me back a little while now to my very first day of ordination training. So we gathered together the whole cohort of people training or starting their training at the same time as me. And our principal stood up and he did the talk on that particular Sunday. And what he did was he brought quite a big box with him. And then he had a couple of volunteers up at the front and he said, well, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you. And then he brought up this big, big, big bucket full of really big stones. He said, what I want you to do is fit as many of those big stones into this big box as you possibly can. So they did. They piled a few of the big things, the big stones into the box. Then he brought out another bucket from under the table and he said, now I've got some kind of some kind of medium sized stones. I want you to try and get as many of those into this box as you can. And so they did. They piled in a few of the medium sized rocks, squeezed them into the corners. And then our principal said, and now I've got this. And from under the table, he brought out another bucket, this time full of gravel. And he said, what I want you to do is I want you to see now that you've put in the big rocks and the medium rocks, how much of these little tiny rocks you can fit in the box. And then they stood back and they completed that task. Actually, there was quite a lot in there. What, of course, our principal wanted us to draw out of that particular illustration is that on the journey ahead for us, on that road that we were about to begin to travel with God as we approached ordination, well, we would all have a certain amount of finite capacity. If we then decided we were going to fill those limited moments and times and spaces available to us with things that, in the grand theme of scheme of things, are quite little, by the time we come to put those big things in, well, all of a sudden, there's no room anymore. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video at this point, have a look at that first question on your sheets, and maybe ask each other, what are, in our own Christian lives, those things that are the big things, those things that are somewhere in the middle, and those things that we need to remember to keep small? Once you've done that, come back and we'll think a little bit more. You can almost imagine Mary and Joseph in a moment like that, can't you? They've been, as Luke tells us, to Passover, which is a regular tradition for them. They're used to the journey. They're used to going backwards. They're used to going forwards. And they're used to all those kind of ordinary things that we know, don't we? Well, have we packed this? Have we packed that? Have you loaded it onto the donkey? Have you made sure you've done this? Have you made sure you've done that? And all of a sudden, on this particular journey, on the way back, well, they may only have had a limited capacity, but there is a certain big thing, isn't there, that they've definitely forgotten. They travel a whole day before they realise Jesus isn't with them. Something I once read about this particular moment tells us that actually there is a key reason that Luke tells us that this happened when Jesus was about 12 years old. 
See, what happens for Jewish young men when they're 12 years old is they have their bar mitzvah. They have that moment where you transition from childhood into adulthood. That does mean there are certain practical considerations. As a child, if you're on a journey, chances are you're going to travel with the women. As a man, you travel with other men. So the fact that Jesus is about 12 years old at this point gives us those hints that Jesus is close to that age. The commentator that I read suggested, and I quite like the suggestion, that on the way down, Jesus travelled with the women. On the way back, having had his bar mitzvah, having had that moment where he transitioned from being a child to a man, he was due to travel back with the men for the first time, to mark this momentous occasion, your first Passover as a man. That means that on the way back, well, Mary, she doesn't see Jesus because he's not supposed to be with her. He's supposed to be with Joseph. And Joseph, having done this year in, year out, begins that journey back and thinks, well, Jesus, he's not with me. Of course he isn't. He travels with his mother. And off they go. All seems so very ordinary, doesn't it? Until a day later, they suddenly find that Jesus isn't with any of them. Must have been an anxious time, mustn't it? Must have been a strange thing to think, well, actually, we've got caught up so much into the practicalities of travel that we've actually forgotten that thing that's most important. So what I'd like you to do, pause the video, have a read through the passage, and then take a look at those questions on the sheet.